this. Oh, man. Just looking down through all the stuff I'm not going to get to tonight. It's just not fair, people. It's just not fair. It just isn't. It says we had nine people. Nine people. Wow, that's a quorum. That's two quorums. Actually, it's three quorums where I come from. <laughs> that's right, three quorums. No waiting. Kelly knows what I'm talking about. Kelly's been there, probably. He was probably there at one of those. Oh, there's ten of us now. That's that's three quorums plus. Yeah. I don't know if this counter on my screen is accurate to the situation, but regardless of the countenance, whether the counter is correct or the, any any of that other kind of kind of technical jargon, hey, it's Tuesday, 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 a day of the time for God and a time for poetry break, poetry break, poetry break. Okay. Well, thanks for stopping in. It's been a couple of weeks. It's been a couple of weeks. Yeah, last week we were just freshly back from uh, where you were just looking there before the curtain went up, the La Push. We were just freshly back from there. And we're uh, celebrating All Hallows' Eve in our traditional way. You've probably, if you were keeping an eye on our pages, you probably saw some pictorial evidence of that. Uh, we've been doing it for some years now. But the poetry break is a whole nother thing, and I missed it. I missed it. Where's the where's the pint? Where's the where's the shot of Irish whiskey, Kelly? Come on. Don't tease. Don't tease like that. Rochelle Hamill's in the house. Mary Pekka is in the house. Mary Pekka's number 10. Oh, there's 12 now. Uh, Mark Kenny. Mark Kenny. Uh, listening in while I cook salmon and cilantro rice. Mm. We had salmon for dinner tonight too, Mark. Yeah. Kelly, give me a shot. Give me a, give me just a one shot of Irish. Come on, to go with this one, the Lori Trout commemorative shots, uh, such a huge part of what makes the poetry break flow, if not stumble. Oh, that's smooth. That is smooth. Yes, indeed. It is uh, Tuesday. It's November the 7th. And uh, let us proceed. You know, I wanted to say at the outset here, we were we weren't here last week, and I think what I think everybody must have been been mad at me for not doing a Halloween show, and so because the mailbag is empty, the mailbag it's been two weeks, and nobody wrote into the mailbag. Oh, except for Rochelle. Sorry, Rochelle. Rochelle wrote in toward the end of the uh, the. Uh, uh, what was allowable. I mean, that means I just saw it this evening. Uh, Rochelle wrote in asking about a poet that no, Rochelle, I have never heard of this poet. If you took the list of the poets I've heard of and the list of poets I've never heard of, I would be embarrassed to be me. And I'm already embarrassed to be me. So let's not add to that. All right. Let's just try to, you know, anyway, who else? Finn Livingston is in the house. Did I see Sam? Sam Weiss. Sam Weiss is in the house. I know what you're waiting for, Sam. It'll be happening. It'll be happening. I just have to, I just have to finalize the presentation. That's right, Sam. Anyway, Kelly, still no shot. What, sunglasses? That's supposed to, what? Finn Livingston, John Daly's in the house. Takes a smooth one to know a smooth one. Right. That's true. All right. John's with me. All right. So nothing in the nothing in in the uh, mailbag. I want to say Rochelle finishing up with that. Uh, don't you don't have to dig around. I, I looked them up, found a used copy of the book you were speaking of, and ordered it. So by this time next week, uh, maybe, but soon, if not next week, then soon, we will be reading some of that stuff. In the meantime, people, I was left to my own devices, and I shouldn't do that. Shouldn't leave Bill to just sit around and, you know, do what Bill does. Actually, I just went to the Poetry Foundation website. They had a, a big swath of fall poems there. And I picked out ones that I thought were particularly interesting for their language, just for the richness of the language. So three exa examples of what Bill considers rich language. The first one from uh, Richard Wilbur, uh, known I think primarily as 
a more more of a traditionalist, meaning he wrote in rhyme and meter. But I just love this poem, and I love Richard Wilbur. I haven't read a ton of him, but everything I've read, uh, I think it was my daughter Alice did a paper in high school about Richard Wilbur, and that got me reading Richard Richard Wilbur, and I said, "Darn it, this Richard Wilbur guy, you know, he wasn't famous for nothing." So fall poems, starting with Richard Wilbur, uh, the poem is called The Beautiful Changes. The Beautiful Changes. One wading a fall meadow finds on all sides the Queen Anne's lace lying like lilies on water. It glides so from the walker, it turns dry grass to a lake. As the slightest shade of you valleys my mind in fabulous blue lucerne. The beautiful changes as a forest is changed by a chameleon's tuning his skin to it. As a mantis arranged on a green leaf grows into it, makes the leaf leafier, and proves any greenness is deeper than anyone knows. Your hands hold roses always in a way that says they are not only yours. The beautiful changes in such kind ways, wishing ever to sunder things and things selves for a second time, for a second finding, to lose for a moment all that it touches back to wonder. Richard Wilbur, The Beautiful Changes, Fall Poem. I just think this is so nicely done. So nicely done. One wading a fall meadow finds on all sides the Queen Anne's lace lying like lilies on water. It glides so from the walker, it turns dry grass to a lake, as the slightest shade of you valleys my mind in fabulous blue lucernes. Lucernes are like alfalfa, like grasses. The beautiful changes as a forest is changed by a chameleon's tuning its skin to it. As a mantis arranged on a green leaf grows into it, makes the leaf leafier, and proves any greenness is deeper than anyone knows. Your hands hold roses always in a way that says they are not only yours. The beautiful changes in such kind ways, wishing ever to sunder things and things selves for a second finding, to lose for a moment all that it touches back to wonder. All that it touches back to wonder. Ah, I just think that's lovely. Richard Wilbur. Richard freaking Wilbur. <laughs> Freaking. Kim Nelson's here. That means the uh, Lamb Cat, Cat Ranch is on the scene. Donna Strip is in here. That's cool. And KMDK is here as well. That means Cat Eggleston is in the house listening. Uh, Bridget Rochelle. Uh, oh, Lake Lucerne. Yeah, it's true. It could refer to lakes. Rochelle, again. Twice in one day, Rochelle has done me a solid. Thanks, Ma. I just assume that Mom is here. Yeah. We'll just assume that she's here. She's going to love this one. She'll love this one. Beyond the Red River. This is Thomas McGrath, who we've read before. But I just, this is some really rich, loamy poetry. It's loamy. So, Cat and John should appreciate the loam. It's almost like peaty, you know. Beyond the Red River by Thomas McGrath. The birds have flown their summer skies to the south, and the flower money is drying in the banks of bent grass, which the bumblebee has abandoned. We wait for a winter lion, body of ice crystals and sombrero of dead leaves. A month ago, from the salt engines of the sea, a machinery of early storms rolled toward the holiday houses where summer still dozed in the poolside chairs, sipping an aging whiskey of distances and departures. Now the long freight of autumn goes smoking out of the land. My possibles are all packed up, but I still do not leave. I am happy enough here, 
where Dakota drifts wild in the universe, where the prairie is starting to shake in the surf of the winter dark. Hmm. Hmm. Beyond the Red River. Thomas McGrath, man. I continue to see Thomas McGrath as the Woody Guthrie of the poetic world. You know, having lived during the same basic time period and been of a of like mind, I would have thought. Beyond the Red River. The birds have flown their summer skies to the south, and the flower money is drying in the banks of bent grass, which the bumblebee has abandoned. We wait for a winter lion, body of ice crystals and sombrero of dead leaves. A month ago, from the salt engines of the sea, a machinery of early storms rolled toward the holiday houses, where summer still dozed in the poolside chairs, sipping an aging whiskey of distances and departures. Now the long freight of autumn goes smoking out of the land. My possibles are all packed up, but I still do not leave. I am happy enough here, where Dakota drifts wild in the universe, where the prairie is starting to shake in the surf of the winter dark. Thomas McGrath. <laughs> that's chills. I'm sorry, that's chills. Did I read that twice? I did read it twice. It just feels like it needs to be read again. Thomas McGrath. Lori Trout in the house. There's Jamie Turner. Jamie Turner. Hey, Jamie. How you doing? Yeah, well, it was nice, wasn't it, Rochelle? And the last one here is a short one. Where are we at? I'm trying to keep track of the time because I don't, I don't want to overstay my welcome. I don't. I really don't. This is uh, by Annie Finch, another poet who I don't recall ever having read any of before. That does not mean, it's because of my advanced age, that does not mean I've never read any Annie Finch. I just don't remember reading any Annie Finch. So, you know, I've got an extra layer of excuse. If I was 40 years younger and uh, couldn't recall whether I'd ever read any Annie Finch, you might have reason to be concerned. But, you know, now you've got to give me a pass. Final Autumn, this is called, from Annie Finch. Maple leaves turn black in the courtyard. Light drives lower, and one blue jay crams our cold memories out past the sun. Each time your traces come past the shadows and visit under my looking-glass fingers that lift and block out the sun. Come, I'll trace you one final autumn, and you can trace your last homecoming into the snow or the sun. All three stanzas end with the word sun. Final autumn, it's called. Annie Finch. Maple leaves turn black in the courtyard. Light drives lower and one blue jay crams our cold memories out past the sun. Each time your traces come past the shadows and visit under my looking glass fingers that lift and block out the sun. Come, I'll trace you one final autumn, and you can trace your last homecoming into the snow or the sun. She does that in a way that you don't even notice all those suns. I'm going to read it one more time. I'm sorry. It's only nine lines. It goes by too fast. I'll try it a little slower this time, maybe, if I can get away with it. Final autumn. Maple leaves turn black in the courtyard. Light drives lower and one blue jay crams our cold memories out past the sun. Each time your traces come past the shadows and visit under my looking glass fingers that lift and block out the sun. Come, I'll trace you one final autumn and you can trace your last homecoming into the snow or the sun. Autumn stuff, people. Autumn stuff. Yeah. There you go. Bill's picks. Bill's picks. Yeah. You see the you, you see the you see the email address. It's right there. Send me some poetry. 
Don't worry, you you don't have to worry though, Rochelle. Don't worry about it. Okay. Well, I gotta tell you, today, today, people, I started the fourth folder of old manhood. The fourth folder. So I'm gonna read this folder to you now. This one. No, just kidding. I've only got a few here. Well, several. Let's call it several. I think I got like five of them or something. Right. Starting back, because we were out at La Push, uh, it was interesting. I did not push myself to write at La Push, uh, which is it's different for me. I usually take our vacation at La Push as a time to just go crazy. I usually cart my typewriter out there and just, you know, I had my computer, I had it all set up, took my little stand with me because, you know, the higher the keyboard is, the less I tend to slouch, you know. When you're old, you have to worry about things like slouching toward Bethlehem. So this starts on the 26th, and uh, we went out on the 27th, right. I could lie down and nap because I'm that short on sleep, but I've maintained this life to style for 50 years and fight the manly fight with futility. Put him on his back foot, the broken one. Put him on the road to La Push, storm garden, lip of habitat. Stretch his eyes to the horizon again and see who he comes back to old manhood as. Is that a preposition at the end? Once more, I could lie down and nap because I'm that short on sleep, but I've maintained this lifestyle for 50 years and fight the manly fight with futility. Put him on his back foot, the broken one. Put him on the road to La Push, storm garden, lip of habitat. Stretch his eyes to that horizon again and see who he comes back to old manhood as. The ache of bone after three nights in a strange bed. The right hip hasn't complained in a year or more. Now it has found its voice again. Two and a half weeks before my next PT appointment. I'm so happy to be alive. These petty annoyances are milk from the breasts of the goddess. They are my village, my elders, the pains that came to stay before Gabapentin. My parents and grandparents call down their memories from heaven's comfy chairs. Has pain gotten worse as the drugs got better? How would an unmedicated old man write any of this shit down? So I think I'm allowing myself the... Uh, the kind of the spontaneous unrolling of a thought where I start writing before I've decided what I'm writing about, you know, and then I, we discover it together. Isn't that neat? <laughs> it's actually kind of lazy, but <clears throat> that's me. The ache of bone after three nights in a strange bed. The right hip hasn't complained in a year or more. Now it has found its voice again. Two and a half weeks before my next PT appointment. I found out at my PT today that uh, it's probably caused by my lower back, my hip pain. I'm so happy to be alive. These petty annoyances are milk from the breasts of the goddess. They are my village, my elders, the pains that came to stay before gabapentin. My parents and grandparents called down their memories from heaven's comfy chairs. Has pain gotten worse as the drugs got better? How would an unmedicated old man write any of this shit down? Old manhood. Gotta let him be who he is. Gotta let him be who he is, right? Holly Trout Cooper in the house! I got Cooper in the house. Cool. Last full day at the ocean. Quest for rest achieved. 
Long hours left to sleep and read and demand nothing of myself. Good food, granola, cheese, and grapes for breakfast after the sinking moon met the rising sun. Offshore wind throws mist behind the breakers, waves going both ways as modern waves should. No regret for the lack of output on the page. We have reached a certain age where the, it doesn't matter anymore. Onward to the cliffs. Yes. Last full day at the beach, at the ocean. Quest for rest achieved. Long hours left to sleep and read and demand nothing of myself. Good food, granola, cheese, and grapes for breakfast after the sinking moon met the setting sun. Offshore wind throws mist behind the breakers met the rising sun. Think, after the sinking moon met the rising sun. Offshore wind throws mist behind the breakers, waves going both ways like modern waves should. No regret for the lack of output on the page. We've reached a certain age where that doesn't matter anymore. Onward to the cliffs. Okay, now this one gets a little, a little weedy. Not quite as much as the next one, but it does get a little... <clears throat> Okay. Already dreaming of what's to come. Making notes as the world dissolves. Or is it only my place in it? Where will reality stop? Am I already away from it? Is that the vacant look of the distempered old man? Not dementia, perspective. Walking toward the horizon, the vanishing point, one strays out of the conscious mainstream into the pathless forest where memory meets foresight and familiar faces begin to appear. We come to realize that the work we will do next happens on a different map. With new rules and no demands, just the wide screen of our story played out in the theater of all consciousness. Gets a little heavy right there at the end, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I don't know. Someday maybe people will say, did you see how he ended it? Just, you know, really sucked it to you there at the end. Boy, that bill. <laughs> what a, what a schlump. Already dreaming of what's to come, making notes as the world dissolves, or is it only my place in it? Where will reality stop? Am I already moving away from it? Is that the vacant look of the distempered old man? Not dementia, perspective. Walking toward the horizon, the vanishing point, one strays out of the conscious mainstream into the pathless forest where memory meets foresight and familiar faces begin to appear. We come to realize that the work we will do next happens on a different map, with new rules and no demands, just the wide screen of our story played out in the theater of all consciousness. Yeah, well, you know, got to be allowed to wander. Got to be allowed to wander. Out there trolling for surprises. I'm not going to smash any windows. I'll never be that radical. I want to fit in like any middle schooler and try on all the available identities. Land on poet because it seems cool and outside of regular life. No one to answer to except the critics who only want to see my name in print as proof. Time to shit or make new friends. So I make new friends because I don't know how to shit yet. I won't meet myself on the page for years. Lots of inky sheets that say nothing. Practicing for the big time I've yet to find. What I do find is a library written in language I can feel, 
taste the dust and smell the river. Cutting fences and trespassing are part of the territory, and sparing the line for the sake of truth is a betrayal. Poets are radical from the ground up. They have to believe in what no one else has seen. I don't know that I have anything to say about this, except that I, it is one of those ones that starts in one place and ends somewhere else, although I do my best to bring it back, probably because I went, wait a minute, maybe I should try to bring this back to the beginning, and I go back and read the front, I'm like, oh, really? I started there? I'm not going to smash any windows. I'll never be that radical. I want to fit in like any middle schooler and try all the available identities. Land on poet because it seems cool and outside of regular life. No one to answer to except the critics who only want to see my name in print as proof. Time to shit or make new friends. So I make new friends because I don't know how to shit yet. I won't meet myself on the page for years. Lots of inky sheets that say nothing. Practicing for the big time I've yet to find. What I do find is a library written in language I can feel, taste the dust and smell the river. Cutting fences and trespassing are part of the territory, and sparing the line for the sake of truth is a betrayal. Poets are radical from the ground up. They have to believe in what no one else has seen. There you have it, people. Your dose of old manhood this week. I don't know about that stuff, you know, but I have started the fourth folder, so it doesn't look, it doesn't appear that I'm going to be uh, stopping anytime soon. Yeah. 18 people in the house. There's Lori Trout. Lori Trout. Lori Trout, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know when you got here, Lori, but uh, you're still here. We got, we got one shot left. Yeah. Only one shot. One shot left. Is there anybody else back here I've missed? Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. A lot of people hanging out by the dumpster, smoking cigarettes. There's 18 of us here. Yeah. Lori Trout, commemorative shot, numero tres. Ooh. That's the big one. Alrighty then. Louise Glick passed away a few weeks ago. We read some Louise Glick, I think the last time we met. And uh, I wanted to read one more. I got this book, uh, Faithful and Virtuous Night, which came out in 2014. And I found this poem in it that I really liked. I wanted to read it to you. It's in six short parts. They are numbered, and I will read the numbers, okay? It's called An Adventure. <clears throat> An Adventure. One. It came to me one night as I was falling asleep that I had finished with those amorous adventures to which I had long been a slave. Finished with love, my heart murmured, to which I responded that many profound discoveries awaited us, hoping, at the same time, I would not be asked to name them, for I could not name them. But, but, but the belief that they existed, surely that counted for something. Two. The next night brought the same thought, this time concerning poetry, and in the nights that followed, various other passions and sensations were, in the same way, set aside forever. And each night, my heart protested its future, like a small child being deprived of a favorite toy. But these farewells, I said, are the way of things. And once more, I alluded to the vast territory opening to us with each valediction. And with that phrase, I became a glorious knight riding into the setting sun, and my heart became the steed underneath me. 3. I was, you will understand, entering the kingdom of death, 
though why this landscape was so con conventional I could not say. Here, too, the days were very long, while the years were very short. The sun sank over the farm mountain, the stars shone, the moon waxed and waned. Soon, faces from the past appeared to me, my mother and father, my infant sister. They had not, it seemed, finished what they had to say, though now I could hear them because my heart was still. 4. At this point, I attained the precipice, but the trail did not. I saw descend on the other side, rather, having flattened out. It continued at this altitude as far as the eye could see, though gradually the mountain that supported it completely dissolved, so that I found myself riding steadily through the air. All around, the dead were cheering me on, the joy of finding them obliterated by the task of responding to them. As we had all been flesh together, now we were missed. As we had before, had been, as we had been before, objects with shadows, now we were substance without form, like evaporated chemicals. Nay, nay, said my heart, or perhaps nay, nay. It was hard to know. That's N A I G H versus N A Y. Six. Here the vision ended. I was in my bed, the morning sun contentedly rising, the feather comforter mounted in white drifts over my lower body. You had been with me. There was a dent in the second pillowcase. We had escaped from death, or was this the view from the precipice? Or was this the view from the precipice, he said. I will read that again. Thank goodness. Louise Gulick doesn't mess around. Bill messes around. An adventure. One. Wait. What I realized while I was reading that one is that I had yet to put on my groovy reading glasses. Sorry. I know they look really different. An adventure. One. It came to me one night as I was falling asleep that I had finished with those amorous adventures to which I had long been a slave. Finished with love, my heart murmured, to which I responded that many profound discoveries awaited us, hoping, at the same time, I would not be asked to name them, for I could not name them. But the, the belief that they existed, surely this counted for something. Two. The next night brought the same thought, this time concerning poetry, and in the nights that followed various other passions and sensations were, in the same way, set aside forever, and each night my heart protested its future like a small child being deprived of a favorite toy. But these farewells, I said, are the way of things, and once more I alluded to the vast territory opening to us with each valediction. And with that phrase, I became a glorious knight riding into the setting sun, and my heart became the steed underneath me. 3. I was, you will understand, entering the kingdom of death, though why this landscape was so conventional I could not say. Here, too, the days were very long while the years were very short. The sun sank over the far mountain. The stars shone, the moon waxed and waned. Soon, faces from the past appeared to me. My mother and father, my infant sister, they had not, it seemed, finished what they had to say, though now I could hear them because my heart was still. 4. At this point I attained the precipice, but the trail did not, I saw, descend on the other side. Rather, having flattened out, it continued at this altitude as far as the eye could see, though gradually the mountain that supported it completely dissolved, so that I found myself riding steadily through the air. All around the dead were cheering me on, the joy of finding them obliterated by the task of responding to them. 5. As we had all been fleshed together, now we were missed. 
As we had been before objects with shadows, now we were substance without form, like evaporated chemicals. Nay, nay, said my heart, or perhaps nay, nay, it was hard to know. 6. Here the vision ended. I was in my bed, the morning sun contentedly rising, the feather comforter mounded in white drifts over my lower body. You had been with me. There was a dent in the second pillowcase. We had escaped from death, or was this the view from the precipice? Louise Glick, oh. Faithful and Virtuous Knight, is the name of the book. Ah, she's got it going on. She's got it going on. I spent the day today, a lot of the day today, the, the part that I wasn't doing other things. Uh, my poetic part of the day was spent watching videos of Philip Levine. Philip Levine, there's a lot of good material uh, by and about Philip Levine online, on YouTube. So, Also, the entire archive of the Poetry Break happens to be on YouTube, as are the Treehouse Concerts, if one cares to, uh, to um, dip back in time. As I did today, uh, I had one of those memories come up on my Facebook feed right before we started tonight, just as I was logging in to the whole, con the whole you know. Uh, and it had one of those memories, those Facebook memories from three years ago. I was wearing this shirt. You know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Eh? So this is from the uh, book for which uh, Philip Levine won the Pulitzer Prize, 1993. The book is called The Simple Truth. The poem is called The Simple Truth. And uh, if there was another shot sitting here, I'd have it in honor of Philip Levine because this guy speaks. <laughs> he speaks the simple truth. I bought a dollar and a half's worth of small red potatoes, took them home, boiled them in their jackets, and ate them for dinner with a little butter and salt. Then I walked through the dried fields on the edge of town. In middle June, the light hung in the dark furrows at my feet, and in the mountain oaks overhead, the birds were gathering for the night, the jays and mockers squawking back and forth, the finches still darting into the dusty light. The woman who sold me the potatoes was from Poland. She was someone out of my childhood in a pink spangled sweater and sunglasses, praising the perfection of all her fruits and vegetables at the roadside stand, and urging me to taste even the pale, raw, sweet corn trucked all the way, she wrote, she swore, from New Jersey. Eat, eat, she said. Even if you don't, I'll say you did. Some things you know all your life. They are so simple and true, they must be said without elegance, meter, and rhyme. They must be said on the table beside the salt shaker, the glass of water, the absence of light gathering in the shadows of picture frames. They must be naked and alone. They must stand for themselves. My friend Henry and I arrived at this together in 1965 before I went away, before he began to kill himself, and the two of us to betray our love. Can you taste what I'm saying? It is onions or potatoes, a pinch of simple salt, the wealth of melting butter. It is obvious. It stays in the back of your throat like a truth you never uttered because the time was always wrong. It stays there for the rest of your life, unspoken, made of that dirt we call earth, the metal we call salt, in a form we have no words for, and you live on it. Yes, the simple truth. Pulitzer Prize. He won the National Book Award twice, I think. Pulitzer Prize once. I think that was right. He was a guy. If you can watch his inaugural uh, uh, reading as the Poet Laureate, that's on there from the Library of Congress. Lovely. Uh, and then his closing, his closing message as uh, Poet Laureate, where he reads that fabulous essay of his, My Lost Poets. Oh, God. Magical. 
magical. In the meantime, the simple truth will have to be enough. The simple truth. I bought a dollar and a half's worth of small red potatoes, took them home, boiled them in their jackets, and ate them for dinner with a little butter and salt. Then I walked through the dry fields on the edge of town. In middle June, the light hung in the dark furrows at my feet, and in the in the mountain oaks overhead, the birds were gathering for the night, the jays and mockers squawking back and forth, the finches still darting into the dusty light. The woman who sold me the potatoes was from Poland. She was someone out of my childhood in a pink spangled sweater and sunglasses, praising the perfection of all her fruits and vegetables at the roadside stand and urging me to taste even the pale, raw, sweet corn trucked all the way, she swore, from New Jersey. Eat, eat, she said. Even if you don't, I'll say you did. Some things you know all your life. They are so simple and true, they must be said without elegance, meter, and rhyme. They must be laid on the table beside the salt shaker, the glass of water, the absence of light gathering in the shadows of picture frames. They must be naked and alone. They must stand for themselves. My friend Henry and I arrived at this together in 1965 before I went away, before he began to kill himself, and the two of us to betray our love. Can you taste what I'm saying? It, it is onions or potatoes, a pinch of simple salt, the wealth of melting butter. It is obvious. It stays in the back of your throat like a truth you never uttered because the time was always wrong. It stays there for the rest of your life, unspoken, made of that dirt we call earth, the metal we call salt, in a form we have no words for, and you live on it. The Simple Truth, Philip Levine. Philip Levine, there will always be more Philip Levine. Though he is gone. Though he is gone from us. Now we have a little Ted Kuzer, man with a rake. It's this little, little pamphlet that came out from a press called Pulley Press. I believe this was their first publication, Pulley Press, if I'm not mistaken. Didn't they say that somewhere? I don't know. Maybe it says it back here. Ah, launching its first collection. Yes, yes. Man, a man with a rake by Ted Kuzer, another former poet laureate. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. This is called Up Early Writing. Ah, Ted Kuzer, such a mm, very plain spoken. Up Early Writing. My very old dog licks and licks at a spot in the carpet, his mouth making the hollow rhythmic sound of water gurgling out of a jug. There can be nothing to taste there but dust, or perhaps it's the smell of an earlier, more interesting self. For almost an hour, I too have been trying to summon a complicated, spooned and stirred together smell, that of my great aunt Annie's kitchen on a wet spring day in the forties, with a burlap bag of new potatoes slumped by the door, a mason jar of bacon grease pushed to the back of the cooling range, and my sweaty but freshly aproned great aunt Annie with a soggy, sagging cardboard box of squealing piglets, hastily pushed with a dirty bare ankle under the table, snorting and tossing their straw. I wondered as I was rereading some of these the other day whether these are all poems written in a single sentence. Nope, there's a period. Okay. All right. It was just a thought. You know. <laughs> you don't have to jump down my throat about it. Okay. Farm Sale, this is called. Ted Kuzer is the poet laureate of, of uh, Kansas, I believe. He lives in Kansas. No, Nebraska. Sorry. Sorry, Kansas. And sorry, Nebraska. Uh, Ted Kuzer lives and writes on 62 acres of wooded hills and pasture in rural Nebraska with his life with his wife, Kathleen Rutledge, a retired editor of the Lincoln Journal Star. 
None of their property is farmed and is instead left to an abundance of wildlife. Yes. Farm sale. This is called. Arriving late, a man in his 60s has parked at the end of a long line of pickups pulled off on the shoulder. He's got a long walk to the gate, climbing down off his truck and adjusting his ball cap, then slamming the door, though so far down the road that we can scarcely hear the thunk. And now he's starting uphill out of what must be a near silence, little more than a whisper of breeze in the fence and the red cedars behind it, walking up into the auctioneer's amplified prattle. The blue June sky is reflected in each pickup's windows. So is he. Even from this far off, even from this far off, you can see that he's liking the look of himself as he passes. He's got his cap on square. Nothing better to do on a warm Saturday morning than to park at the far end of where all the others have parked and to walk up the road in no hurry to see what's for sale at the sale. Farm sale. Dead Goozer. Did I read that first one twice? Hmm? Hmm? I don't know that I did. I don't remember. Did I? Here, here, there, there. Another poet I'll have to look into. All right, Rochelle. Glad to hear it. Hayden Reese is here. Hayden Reese is here. Got out of detention. Oh, good for you. All right. Did you sneak out like last time? That's what I would have done. Yeah, you, know, you start doing spit wads to the other side of the room, making noises. So that Mr. Platt, was it Mr. Platt? <clears throat> is distracted. Because you know Mr. Platt is... So distracted. He's the guy that called me Davy Williams all year one year when he was calling roll. Davy Williams. So that I had, finally, I was completely out of, uh, you know, alphabetical order. And yet, if I didn't respond to Davy Williams, he'd mark me absent. So I just start saying, here, farm sale by Ted Kuzer. Arriving late, a man, Rochelle probably remembers Mr. Platt. That's right. Farm sale. Arriving late, a man in his 60s has parked at the end of a long line of pickups pulled off on the shoulder. He's got a long walk to the gate, climbing down out of his truck and adjusting his ball cap, then slamming the door, though so far down the road that we can scarcely hear the thunk. And now he's starting uphill, out of, starting uphill out of what must be a near silence, little more than a whisper of breeze in the fence and the red cedars behind it, walking up into the auctioneer's amplified prattle. The blue June sky is reflected in each pickup's windows. So is he. Even from this far off, you can see, see he's liking the look of himself as he passes. He's got his cap on square. Nothing better to do on a, on a warm Saturday morning than to park at the far end of where all the others have parked and to walk up the road in no hurry to see what's for sale at the sale. Whew! Ted Coozer! Ted Coozer! Hold on. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, there it is. Shelter belt. Shelter belt, this is called. Ah. From a mile off, it's a coarse, knotty seam clumsily stitched from odd snippets of thread, black, gray, and green, but somehow it's holding, suspending the heavy brown corduroy fields from the thin cotton sky, nothing you'd want to show off in home ec class, but finding a use, makeshift curtain, hung there since the thirties, piece from scrap fabric, using native trees, cedar and ash, and tacked over a window with a whispery all-season crack at the far back of the present, in an unheated room used for storing the dusty old past. Shelter Belt From a mile off, it's a coarse, knotty seam, clumsily stitched from odd snippets of thread, black, gray, and green, but somehow it's holding, suspending the heavy brown corduroy fields from the thin cotton sky. 
Nothing you'd want to show off in home ec class, but finding a use, makeshift curtain, hung there since the 30s, pieces from scrap fabric, using native trees, cedar, and ash, and tacked over a window with a whispery all-season crack at the far back of the present, in an unheated room used for storing the dusty old past. He's just, he's got just enough whimsy to make you kind of go, yeah, yeah. There's warmth there, isn't there? There's warmth, warmth, warmth. And I believe that's all, folks. Now, I did not want to hear the poetry blues being played by our local, uh, a local combo. I don't like listening to the poetry blues come over the airwaves, reminding me that it's time to wrap up the poetry break. Hey! The poetry blues. Oh, well. Oh, well. Let's run back through. Hey, John Gorski came in. Hey, John Walter Gorski. How you doing? Sandy Snyder was here. Rochelle Hamill. John Walter Gorski, the aforementioned. Hayden Reese. Uh, Diane Schulstad was here. Yes, as was Laurie Trout, the infamous Laurie Trout. Kelly Murphy, though he offered no Irish whiskey, probably best that you didn't. I probably had enough. Uh, Holly Trout Cooper. Yes. Who else? Cindy Snyder. Did I mention her already? Did I mention Rochelle? See, I get to this point in rereading the list, and I forget who's already passed. Yeah, Rochelle. I know I mentioned. Jamie Turner. There you go. There you go. Jamie and, and Lori were probably off talking in the corner somewhere. Bridget Lacey here as well. Kim Nelson. Yes, yes, yes. Donna Strepp. John Daly. Unbelievable. And KMDK, let's not forget. And Finn Livingston was here as well, as was Sam Wise. Sam, Mark Kenny, here, here, Mary Pekka, this very place, these people, Janine Boggs, oh, 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 you know, and Katrina Knight, Katrina, as always, Katrina, all you guys, thanks once again for, uh, for keeping, keeping me steady, I should say, uh, that the hand is, is, uh, on her uh, on the on the radiation road, and uh, we had day two this morning. Tomorrow will be day three, day three of twenty nine days. So she'll be finishing up uh, the radiation treatments, I believe, on the nineteenth of December. So our holidays are going to be quiet this year, but we will rouse ourselves one hour per week or thereabouts for the poetry break. This is ener as energetic as I probably, you know, have looked all week or will look all week. Actually, I'm fairly energetic. One more health update. My foot was cleared for takeoff. My foot has been cleared for takeoff. My broken foot is not broken anymore. But I have not started walking again. I will probably start on Friday because and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you. It's because my new shoes haven't arrived yet. Yes, I've ordered some new shoes. They are zero-rise shoes, which I like, but they are cushy, cushy shoes. They're ultras, and they're coming. They're supposed to be stable, too. I need some stability, and I need more cush, because the bones are just old. Okay? All right. Enough said. Although I did see, when I was seeing the podiatrist, I was looking at, the, at all the little models and charts and diagrams of feet, and they showed a broken uh, metatar... Uh, what was my fourth metatarsal? Was it? Was it the metatarsal? The fourth metatarsal is what I broke. And they showed a picture of a broken metatarsal, and it said next to it, runner's injury. Yeah, runner's injury. Yeah. Well, usually usually you have to run. All I had to do was walk. So, you know, it takes a certain kind of person, sure, to get a broken metatarsal as a runner. But to get it as a walker, that's, that's an achievement. <laughs> Something I feel quite good about, or did. Anyway, thanks, you guys. As always, you are, uh, you are my friend group. <laughs> and uh, you are holding both of us up, both me and the hand, as you can probably tell by, by the hand's comments on this. This will stay on Facebook, but a edited version will take out the part with the curtain closed. We put that up on, 
on the YouTube page in case you ever want to watch it again. Or you look at the list of poems, poets that we feature, and then you can go in and, you know, check those particular poems out again. Yeah. All right. All right. Stay in touch. And uh, have a poetic week. Take care of each other. Uh, Diane and I are taken care of. We are good together. Okay. And we will see you next week, the 14th of November, 167 hours from right about 